Thank you, chairpersons, and good afternoon, respected seniors and friends. As a background to understanding the surgical procedures for extrahepatic portal vein obstruction, I would begin by saying that EHPVO is exclusively a vascular pathology, wherein primarily the liver function is normal, and therefore subsequent metabolic abnormalities are secondary to the liver being deprived of portal blood flow for a long time, which carries important hepatotrophic factors, and development of spontaneous portosystemic shunts, which allow cerebral enterotoxins to be delivered directly into the systemic circulation without undergoing hepatic detoxification. So here the hepatic sinusoidal pressure is normal, which together with high pressure in the obstructive splanchnic bed results in the formation of high pressure collaterals which replace the thrombosportal vein, but the direction of flow in these collaterals in EHPVO is hepatopetal, unlike intrahepatic portal vein obstruction, intrahepatic portal hypertension, where the direction of flow of blood in these collaterals is hepatofugal. Now, torrential bleed from gastroesophageal varices has been the most life-threatening and most frequently discussed consequence of EHPVO, and most treatment modalities so far have focused on the management of gastroesophageal variceal bleed. And the two modalities of therapy for gastroesophageal varices have been surgery and endoscopic therapy. But the role of each of these modalities has evolved through phases over the last few decades. And long-term follow-up has led to changing concepts about the natural history of this disease, and hence, a need for reappraisal of their respective rules. So first came surgery, and one of the earliest landmark surgical series was that by Bismuth et al. in the year 1980, who reported excellent results of shunt surgery in children. However, a decade later, in 1980s and 1990s, endoscopic therapy was projected as the primary and best therapy for very cell bleed, and shunt surgery was relegated a select secondary role in select situations. However, Two decades of experience with endoscopic therapy in children at our institution, that is SGP JMS Lucknow, has shown that EHPVO has several far-reaching delayed sequelae beyond endoscopic eradication of gastroesophageal viruses, which significantly affect the quality of life. And therefore, in the year 2014, the question is, what is the role of surgery in the management of EHPVO in the current era of endoscopic therapy. Now, primary endoscopic therapy, in our experience, has resulted in a shift in indications of portosystemic shunt surgery for EHPVO, in the sense that emergency surgery for acute variceal bleed is rarely warranted, because this can be handled by endoscopy very effectively. But the number of surgical referrals for delayed sequelae are progressively increasing as the duration of follow-up falling endoscopy eradication of varices is increasing. So what are the indications for surgery beyond endoscopic eradication of gastroesophageal viruses? And these are bleed from secondary, isolated, large gastric fundal varices or ectopic viruses. The term secondary implies that these viruses have reappeared after primary eradication of gastroesophageal viruses. And a study from our center indicated that actually the incidence of these secondary gastric viruses ectopic viruses, and portal hypertensive gastropathy increases after endoscopic eradication of gastroesophageal viruses. And when they bleed, they bleed more torrentially. They are difficult to control endoscopically. And the site of ectopic viruses can range from duodenum to small bowel, the anorectal region, the biliary tree, and any sites of anastomosis or stoma. And then there are issues related to large spleen, which cause early satiety, chronic discomfort, easy fatigability, restriction of physical activity, and all each of these impair the quality of life. Large spleens can manifest as clinically symptomatic hypersplenism in the form of nasal bleed, menorrhagia, spontaneous ecchymosis or petechiae, and chronic fatigue because of chronic anemia. Or as acutely painful splenomegaly, because of a splenic infarct. Now, one third to one half of these patients would have growth retardation, and the pathophysiology hypothesized here is a large spleen causing early satiety or chronic anemia. 
Portal hypertensive entropathy leading to malabsorption. Now the liver is deprived of portal blood flow that causes carries important hepatotrophic factors. And a study from our center has suggested that these children have deficiency of insulin-like growth factor and growth hormone resistance. But since both the conventional portosystemic shunts as well as a mesorex bypass result in a benefit of growth, it appears that both portal hypertension and impaired portal venous blood flow contribute to growth retardation. Now, while we have conventionally believed that portal biliopathy is a problem that afflicts EHPVO patients in the second or fourth decade of life, clinically significant cholestasis because of portal biliopathy is being increasingly recognized in pediatric age group, and this has serious long-term implications. So the normal venous anatomy of the biliary tree is comprised of the paracholedocal plexus of veins, which run parallel to the CBD, and the epicholedocal plexus of veins, which form a fine reticular mesh on the surface of the CBD. So the pathogenesis of portal biliopathy is related to extensive compression by high pressure paracholedocal and epicholedocal collaterals. The pressure in these collaterals being higher than biliary pressure, and this results in morphological changes of the biliary tree in the form of indentation and irregularity, intraluminal filling defects because of intra and paracholedocal collaterals, angulation and displacement because of portal cavernoma and fibrosis in the hepatodural ligament, eventually culminating into strictures because of ischemia and dilatation. And these children also have a higher incidence of CBT calculi because of biliary stasis and increased hemolysis. So cholestasis in portal biliopathy can be symptomatic in the form of jaundice, cholangitis, pruritus, pain because of gallstones or CBD calculi. But more importantly, it may culminate into secondary biliary cirrhosis in as many as 2 to 4%. It may be clinically asymptomatic and yet of concern if it is associated with a persistently elevated gamma GT. So, primary biliary drainage surgery without prior portal decompression is fraught with risk of life-threatening hemorrhage because of presence of high pressure collaterals and because the strictures here are multiple and high in the hilum and therefore difficult to access by surgery. And hence, portosystemic shunt surgery plays a key role in the surgical management because it relieves biliary obstruction in several and hence obviates the need for any further surgical intervention on the biliary tree. In the others, it renders biliary surgery safe by decompressing the high pressure collaterals. So the management algorithm for a patient who presents with clinical cholestasis in the form of cholangitis or jaundice begins with antibiotics to which one may need to add an endoscopic or a percutaneous transhepatic biliary drainage, after which a total portosystemic shunt or a mesorex bypass needs to be performed. Reassessment is done after three to six months to assess shunt potency and features of clinical cholestasis. After effective portal decompression, resolution of clinical cholestasis may take place in a large proportion of patients but persistence of clinical cholestasis indicates that the patient has perhaps developed a fixed ischemic stricture and hence a need for hepatogogenostomy. It is worth remembering that any endoscopic intervention in these children in the form of endoscopic biliary dilatation or endoscopic papillotomy is associated with a relatively higher incidence of hemobilia or bleed from periampillary viruses. Now, I put forward this study because it exclusively highlights the problem of cholestasis in children with extrahepatic portal vein obstruction. Clinically or biochemically significant cholestasis was reported in 6% of 121 children with EHPVO, age ranging from as young as 4 years to 11 years. Varying rates of liver fibrosis was seen in all, and cirrhosis was reported as early as 10 years of age. However, Normalization of symptoms, liver enzymes, and intrahepatic biliary radical dilatation after effective portal decompression was seen in 100% of children, which implies that early portal decompression before fixed ischemic strictures develop is more effective in reversing clinical cholestasis. These authors also surmised 
that endoscopic therapy exacerbated portal bilopathy by sclerosing or suppressing spontaneous portosystemic collateralization. Symptomatic anorectal varices and portal colopathy in constitute indication for surgery in 0.5 to 10% of cases. And on endoscopy, there are two patterns of portal colopathy. They may be in the form of anorectal varices, but it is more important to recognize mucosal changes, which may vary from erythema to a mosaic-like pattern, or vascular lesions, including cherry red spots or telangiectasia, and rarely as ulcers, which may closely mimic inflammatory bowel disease. So today, endoscopic therapy and surgery have a complementary role. Now the next question is, what is the surgical procedure of choice? Now, conventionally, the procedures for EHPVO have been broadly defined as portosystemic shunt procedures and non-shunt procedures, of which the shunt procedures are always preferred. And to this classification, in the last one decade, has been added a mesorex bypass, which actually has resulted in a resurgence of interest in surgery for extrahepatic portal vein obstruction in the West, and has been a topic of much debate, which will, I, I will address in the latter part of my discussion. And for the benefit of postgraduates in the audience, I will briefly outline the advantages and limitations of each of these procedures and hence the decision making in a given clinical scenario. Now, portosystemic shunt procedures have the advantage that they have low rebleed rates. They also take care of issues related to large spleen, ectopic viruses, biliopathy, and colopathy, and they enhance growth. And on the basis of hemodynamics, they have been classified as total shunts and selective shunts. Partial shunts are rarely done in EHPVO children. Now the total shunts are so-called because they completely divert all portal flow away from the liver, and hence they achieve an effective decompression of the entire portal venous system and an excellent bleed control rates. And the first in the category of total shunts is a splenectomy with an end-to-side splenorenal shunt, the advantages of which is that it takes care of issues related to a large spleen. But the limitations is that it is not a very good shunt for splenic vein diameter less than 5 millimeter. There is a relatively higher incidence of angulation and shunt block. It has a relatively longer operating time and greater blood loss as compared to the spleen preserving shunts because splenectomy in EHPVO, especially in adolescents, can be a technically challenging procedure and there is a small risk of post splenectomy sepsis. The second in the category of a total shunt is a side-to-side -side splenorenal shunt, and the advantages of this procedure is that it permits a large diameter vascular anastomosis in a relatively small diameter splenic vein, which means that with a five millimeter splenic vein, one could achieve a vascular anastomosis of 15 millimeters. There is lesser risk of angulation and twisting because the vascular anastomosis is securely anchored at both the ends, and it is a spleen-preserving shunt. But for the same reason, it is less effective in taking care of issues related to a huge spleen. The third in the category of a total shunt is a mesocaval shunt, which could either be an end-to-side mesocaval shunt or an edge graft mesocaval shunt using an autologous jugular vein graft. And these shunts have also been reported to have good long-term shunt potency, lesser risk of angulation as compared to the central end-to-side splenorenal shunt, it is a spleen-preserving shunt, but for the same reason, it is not very effective in taking care of issues related to a huge spleen. Now, a typical example of a selective shunt is a distal splenorenal shunt, wherein the splenic vein is disconnected at its junction with the SMV and anastomose to the renal vein here. So, by concept, a selective shunt compartmentalizes the portal venous system into a decompressed gastrosplenic circuit wherein the gastroesophageal varices decompress through the short gastric vessels and the splenic vein into the systemic circulation. But prograde portal perfusion is maintained through the hypertensive superior mesenteric circuit. So the advantages of this shunt are that it maintains hepatopetal portal perfusion and hence lesser risk of post shunt encephalopathy. But the limitations are that it does not take care of issues related to massive splenomegaly. And it is important to remember that the shunt does not decompress ectopic viruses and collaterals in the hepatotural ligament and therefore is not a shunt of choice 
for portal biliopathy, and it is technically more demanding. Now, the non shunt procedures entail devascularization of greater two thirds of the stomach, ligation of the left gastric vein, devascularization of the lower seven centimeters of the esophagus, combined with splenectomy, which may or may not be combined with an esophageal transaction, a pyloroplasty, or an anti reflux procedure. But because these procedures do not decompress the hypertensive portal venous system, they have a higher rebleat on long term follow up and they are indicated when the anatomy is not shuntable or in an emergency setting for uncontrolled bleed because the morbidity and mortality of an emergency shunt is higher than that of an emergency devascularization. Now, a mesorex bypass has been a topic of much discussion in the literature and therefore I would address this question. What is the need and justification for a mesorex bypass in extrahepatic portal vein obstruction wherein for decades we have believed that the liver architecture and function are presumably normal. Now the consequences of extrahepatic portal vein obstruction are threefold. One, that it leads to portal hypertension. Two, that the liver is relatively deprived of hepatotrophic factors, which in long-term follow-up may result in impairment of liver synthetic functions, which manifest as prolongation of INR, and impaired liver and somatic growth. And three, that it leads to natural portosystemic shunting, as a result of which cerebral enterotoxins, especially ammonia, bypass hepatic degradation, which may manifest as minimal hepatic encephalopathy. So the concerns related to total portosystemic shunts are that while in non-shunted patients of EHPVO, there is a significant amount of prograde portal perfusion maintained, a total shunt transforms hepatopetal flow in the hepatodural collaterals into hepatofugal flow, as a result of which the liver is further deprived of hepatotrophic factors. And they add to pre-existing natural portosystemic shunting, which may exacerbate minimal hepatic encephalopathy. So the next question is that do, do total shunts predispose to encephalopathy in EHPVO? And several large clinical case series in the past have reported zero overt encephalopathy, the term overt is important, following total shunts and extrahepatic portal vein obstruction. However, elegantly performed studies as early as 1980s by Warren et al. and a series of recent studies have raised concerns about possibility of minimal or subclinical hepatic encephalopathy, which would manifest in the form of mild neurocognitive defects, affecting mainly attention, speed of information processing, motor abilities and coordination, which need to be diagnosed by careful psychological testing, and this particular aspect deserves a scientific and a critical reappraisal. And although the gross histology of these livers is normal, total shunts have been shown to result in atrophy, fatty infiltration, and deglycogenation of hepatocytes. And a pilot study on this aspect from our center at ASGPJMS concluded that EHPVO is a true hyperammonia model caused by natural portosystemic shunting in the presence of normal liver function, and hyperammonia results in generalized low grade cerebral edema and cognitive decline, and further longitudinal studies are needed to validate this observation. So, a mesorex bypass is an attractive option because it is a restorative or a physiological shunt which restores normal hepatopetal portal blood flow by interposition of a vein graft, which is usually a juggler vein graft, between a vein of the extrahepatic portal venous system and the left branch of the portal vein in the recess of Rex. And this vein of the extrahepatic portal venous system is usually the SMV, but in the presence of non-availability of SMV, the splenic vein, the left coronary vein, and even the pancreatic duodenal veins have been utilized. So the Rex recess is the space between segment three and four of the liver, and an important anatomical landmark is to follow the umbilical ligament down to its base in the recess of Rex. So to be able to perform this procedure, the anatomical prerequisites are a patency of left branch of the portal vein in the recess of Rex, which is most crucial, then availability of a patent SMV and the SMV splenic vein junction, and availability of bilateral internal juggler veins, 
And with these anatomical prerequisites, 60% of children would perhaps qualify for this procedure. So conceptually, this is an ideal procedure because it restores hepatopetal pleural blood flow. It enhances liver and somatic growth. It corrects deranged INR and it reverses minimal hepatic encephalopathy. So eventually, the surgical decision making in a given clinical scenario would be determined by the anatomy of portal venous system, the indication for surgery, and last but not the least, the comfort of the surgeon with a particular surgical procedure. Now in a series of 200 children with extrahepatic portal vein obstruction, Orloff et al. reported that the portal vein alone is involved in 75% of the cases. But in 25% of patients, there is concomitant involvement of the splenic vein or the SMV. And in 10% cases, the entire splenoportal venous axis is thrombosed. So for performing a shunt procedure, the first step is to assess the anatomy of the splenoportal venous axis by doing a Doppler, a CT portovenogram, or an MR portovenogram, wherein if the splenic vein or the superior mesenteric vein, rarely the IMV and the left coronary vein have also been used. If they are shuntable, then one would elect to do a portosystemic shunt surgery or a mesorex bypass. Wherein, if the anatomy is non-shuntable, then one would elect to do a splenectomy with a gastroesophageal devascularization. So if we put the anatomy of the SPV and the indication for surgery together and take a clinical case scenario where the patient has presented primarily with issues related to a huge spleen and the varices have been eradicated or are amenable to endoscopic therapy, then if the splenic vein is shuntable, one would elect to do a splenectomy and use this opportunity to combine it with a central end to side splenorenal shunt. Whereas if the splenic vein is not shuntable, then one would perhaps do a splenectomy with a devascularization because here the quality of life of the patient is being affected with a huge spleen. On the other hand, if the indication for surgery was variceal bleed and the splenomegaly was mild to moderate with no hypersplenism, then if the splenic vein was shuntable, one would either do a side-to-side -side splenorenal shunt or a distal splenorenal shunt, while if the splenic vein was not shuntable, but the SMV is shuntable, then one could do a mesocaval shunt or a mesorex bypass, depending on a person's philosophy. Now, if hypersplenism is the primary indication for surgery, should a shunt surgery be added to splenectomy? The answer is yes, if the splenic vein is shuntable, because Splenectomy inevitably results in splenic vein thrombosis and loss of a shuntable vein should the patient present with other delayed sequelae of EHPVO later in life. And it is also believed that splenectomy in long term actually exacerbates portal hypertension because spleen acts as a pop-up valve and buffers the raised portal pressures by continuous enlargement of its size. In the post-operative management, I will address three issues, anticoagulation, assessment of shunt potency, and profile access for post splenectomy sepsis. Now regarding anticoagulation, unfortunately, there is lack of consensus and a uniform protocol across various centers uh, in, the, in the world. The AIMS protocol comprises of intraoperative injection of heparinized saline into splenic vein post splenic vein ligation. Then in the first 24 hours post-surgery, the child is given three alicots of 10% Lomodex while ensuring adequate hydration. And from post of day two onwards, oral ecosprin is started and continued for three months. On the other hand, Professor S.K. Mitra's group at PGI Chandigarh and the Bismuth's group gives intraoperative heparin 100 international units per kg, which is continued postoperatively till day seven. While Jean Deville Tigoe's group and Ricardino Superina's group gives intraoperative heparin continued postoperatively till day seven followed by oral aspirin for six months. And this is the protocol which we have currently been following at SGPJMS Lucknow. Now our protocol for assessment of shunt potency begins with intraoperative pre and post shunt portal pressure measurement, after which we do a Doppler on post-operative day seven, followed by six monthly Dopplers for first two years and a yearly Doppler thereafter. If the Doppler fails to visualize the shunt, we would do a CT portovenogram. We would do one upper GI endoscopy at six months post-surgery, 
following which if the varices are eradicated, we would not repeat an endoscopy. Now about post vinectomy sepsis, I would present whatever little literature I could get from our country. Dr. Samarin Nandi's group from Ames reported 0.6% of post vinectomy meningitis, but this group does not recommend any immunization or post vinectomy prophylaxis. A smaller study from PGI Chandigarh did not report any post vinectomy sepsis, but they do immunize their children and give post vinectomy penicillin for two years, and this is what we have been doing at SGPGMS also. In post-operative follow-up, one looks for re-bleed, post vinectomy sepsis, growth, LFTs if, the pre -op if there was pre-operative biliopathy, and hemogram and splenic size uh, in spleen-preserving shunt procedures is a very good indicator of shunt potency. Now this slide is a summary of some of the landmark series across the globe on the conventional portosystemic shunts, which show that the operative mortality of elective shunts is zero, but the mortality of an emergency shunt is higher, and this is from Dr. Samiran and this group at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. The shunt thrombosis rates have ranged from 2.5% to 13%. And this slide is a summary of results from, of the mesorex bypass, wherein again the shunt thrombosis rates have ranged from 4% to 19% and are comparable to the conventional portosystemic shunt procedures. Now, at SGPGI, in the last 13 years, we have operated upon 103 children with EHPVO. Most patients had a combination of indications for surgery, which in order of frequency were issues related to large spleen. Then there were isolated large gastric fundal varices, F2 or F3. There was a patient of bleeding duodenal varices and isolated extensive small bowel varices with three emergency shunt surgeries. The other indications were growth retardation. Portal biliopathy was an indication for surgery in 12% of our children, and this is important, because two of these children actually required a preoperative endoscopic biliary drainage because they presented with conjugated hyperbilirubinema ex exceeding 10 mg percent and had low-grade smoldering cholangitis. And one child aged 10 years of age actually had secondary biliary cirrhosis at the time of shunt surgery. So our experience corroborates very closely with the French series reported by Willers et al. Portal colopathy form and other rare indications were other indications. So we have done various kinds of portal systemic shunt surgery in 86 children. The commonest being splenectomy with central end to side splenorenal shunt. We have done in selective situations, depending on the clinical indication, a side to side splenorenal shunt and an edge graft interposition mesocaval shunt. We've been forced to take recourse to some unconventional shunt procedures, depending on the indication and the anatomy. And these were an inferior mesentric vein to a left renal vein shunt, an IMV to an IVC shunt, an edge graft interposition splenorenal shunt, a splenoadrenal shunt, and a makeshift shunt. And we have not fortunately had any post-operative mortality. And while on post-operative day seven, 96% of our shunts were patent on long-term follow-up ranging from 10 months to 13 years, with a median of five and a half years, some of our shunts have had delayed block, and at last follow-up, 90% of our shunts are patent. So the conclusions from my talk are that primary endoscopic therapy has resulted in a shift in indications of surgery for EHPVO from acute variceal bleed to delayed sequelae. Having eliminated mortality due to acute variceal bleed by endoscopic therapy, the quality of life is then determined by these delayed sequelae. And a study from our center had shown that post variceal eradication, splenic size, and growth retardation were independent predictors of quality of life, which was seen to improve after surgery. Further, some of these delayed sequelae, like portal biliopathy, have serious long-term implications. And hence, shunt surgery continues to hold forth as a single-time definitive procedure in alleviating bleed and non-bleed consequences of EHPVO despite the advent of endoscopic therapy. And before I end my talk, to all my mentors in the audience, thank you for inspiring me into the science and art of pediatric surgery. And to the organizing committee, thank you for giving me this beautiful opportunity of sharing and learning. Thank you very much. The paper is open for discussion. Yes, please.
identify yourself and Rajendra Sauji from Nagpur. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my question to you is, in case of portal biliopathy, if you do not have shuntable veins, what would be your approach? Yeah. So, portal biliopathy with non-shuntable veins is a difficult uh, clinical problem. But uh, when we are talking of non-shuntable veins, we have to remember that we are not talking only of splenic vein and superior mesenteric vein because in situations like this, there are times when other pe our surgeons and also us have taken resource to utilizing the inferior mesenteric vein or the left coronary vein for doing a shunt. So one has to kind of extend the spectrum when you talk of non-shuntable anatomy when the indication for surgery uh, for doing a shunt surgery is uh, very uh, clear. Secondly, if you just do not have any shuntable vein in the portal venous system, then you have no option but to take recourse to endoscopic therapy. So these patients would be put on, say, long-term endoscopy exchange, uh, stent chain exchange program. Secondly, our observation is that by the end of one year or two years, when do you do check endoscopic evaluation for varices after so-called successful surgery shunt or very satisfactory splenectomy devascularization modified Segura procedure, almost 50 to 60 percent of them have reappearance of varices. Though they are not bleeding, they are otherwise doing well, but they are low-grade varices which appear, which corroborate or uh, correlates with other literature findings. How about your experience in that situation and any reaction or how do you react to that? No, here I think I would like to differentiate a patent shunt versus a devascularization procedure. So if a shunt is patent and on the first endoscopic evaluation following a shunt surgery, the varices have disappeared or there is significant downgrading of varices, then if the shunt continues to be patent, there is no reason why the varices should reappear. So if the varices reappear, then for us, it means that the shunt is beginning to stenose and we would seriously look at that by doing a C2 portovenogram and if a shunt is beginning to stenose, maybe, you know, we would kind of do a percutaneous dilatation of the shunt and put this child on long-term anticoagulation. In fact, we had a child recently, uh, uh, just a month ago. But recurrence of varices after a devascularization procedure is very well known because here you are not decompressing the hypertensive portal venous system. So we know that on long-term follow-up, 30% of the patients would have recurrence of varices and would rebleed. So we have to differentiate a, effect, a working shunt from a devascularization procedure. Okay. Thank you. Can I have one more uh, question? Uh, yeah. I am Satish Mandit from Panipat. I have one query mm -hmm. is that you said internal jugular should be patent. What is the role of internal jugular? Number two is ecosporin. Is dose fixed 50 kg, 50 milligram, or is it variable? And I have a comment that we should give pneumococcal vaccine routinely after splenectomy. So uh, internal jugular vein, I was talking about for a mesorex bypass or for a edge graft interposition, mesocable shunt. So in children, we do not like to use any prosthetic grafts that you would know. So we always like to use autologous vein grafts of which in terms of quality and the diameter, the internal juggler is the best. But in case it is not available, the other veins that have been used are the saphenous veins, the inferior mesenteric vein. You mean to say you uh, in, uh, harvest juggler for the shunting? So from if, if bilateral internal juggler veins are patent, we... One of the jugglers you use for grafting. Yeah, yeah. Right. And... Um, Ecosporin dosage. Ecosporin... Um, uh, as far as dose is concerned, I mean, for children are above six years of age or so, we tend to use baby ecosprin, that is 75 milligram, uh, that is what we do. And what was your third question? Sorry. Third forgotten. is that pneumococcal vaccine should be used. I think it is freely available now, there is no shortage. So, we should not um, wait and watch, yeah. it should be routinely used. Yeah. So actually there is very little literature from Indian subcontinent on what should be the pre-operative and post-operative profile axis following splenectomy. I mean, I really search for that literature, but there's very little literature, but whatever literature is available, on the basis of that, we kind of continue to immunize our children, especially those that are younger than nine years of age, and we can give them post prophylaxis profile access with amoxicillin or oral penicillin. You're right, thank you. Can I ask Dr. Gopi? Thank you, madam, for the elaborate coverage and uh, lucid description. My question is, uh, uh, let us uh, have an idea of on etiology in your uh, last series. And uh, another question is, uh, what is the younger stage by which uh, you advise surgery? Because delaying surgery 
will lead to biliopathy and hypersplenism. So as far as etiology is concerned, um, honestly speaking, uh, we, had a, we had at SGPGIMS done a small pilot study on whether these children have a prothrombotic state. And we did not find a significant incidence of prothrombotic states in children with EHPVO. And even in the literature, there is no definite e evidence to suggest that prothrombotic states contribute to EHPVO in children. They contribute much more to EHPVO in adults. Now, other things like umbilical vein catheterization, exchange transfusions, any portal pyemia because of abdominal sepsis, that history you would perhaps get in a small percentage of children. Then uh, your uh, second question was... Uh, the youngest patient. So the youngest patient on whom we have operated was a one and a half year old child who presented with extensive small bowel varices where endoscopic therapy was just not an option. And his splenic vein was five millimeter and we did a side to side splenorenal shunt. And it is not that we would wait for portal biliopathy. It is just that as and when the patient has any indication for surgery, we would go for a shunt. And off late, even if the patient has persistently elevated gamma GT, and does not have clinically symptomatic biliopathy in a child, we would, our threshold for performing a shunt is low. We would offer a shunt surgery to that child. The last man, Dr. Dasmit. Uh, yeah, a lot of uh, newer shunts have come in, like endovascular shunts, and that is catching up a lot all over the world. Any idea about what is to be done? Because in that, no, it's not a surgical procedure. They go in through the internal uh, jugular vein. It's done like an angioplasty. And internally, they bore a hole right through the liver and connect uh, yeah, the so two Dr. systems. Yeah, so Dr. Dasmi, that is known as TIPS, trans yeah, intrahepatic that. portal systemic shunt. But that does not apply to extrahepatic portal vein obstruction because here the portal vein is thrombosed and is replaced by a cavernoma. So TIPS is a procedure which is done as a bridge to a liver transplantation in any patient of chronic liver disease who presents with, say, life-threatening bleed or uh, ascites. So TIPS is not a procedure that is feasible in EHP view at all. Thank you, Dr. Raal. Thank you for a beautiful. <laughs> Hello, Richard, please. You have given us a, a, a really good trade is on uh, transfer. Thank you.